Good afternoon, stroke evening. Um, welcome to the final ever developer session here at Ells Court EGX 2014. Uh, thank you so, so much for coming along uh, here in your auditorium. It's really good to have a packed house for the last one uh, for our very, very special guest. And thank you so much, everyone watching on Twitch. Um, we are going to have time at the end for some questions, so uh, please get thinking of anything you want to ask, and we should have a fair amount of time to rattle through a few of those. Uh, but without any further ado, please give a big hand up for Dean Hall. Okay, so uh, thanks everyone for coming here. This is kind of weird. It's my first, like, I guess, mostly non-DAISY presentation. So for those of you who, who don't uh, know me, I'm Dean Hall. Uh, I created the mod DAISY. The first actual talk I gave about it was at REST, I think it was 2012. Uh, I think that's when I, I first did it. So it's kind of cool to be back at, uh, be ba back at Eurogamer now, again, sort of talking about some of my lessons, and then I guess talking about what's next. And from my perspective, it's really more of a, uh, I guess, a conversation. Like, I, I, I'd really like feedback, and that's why the Q&A is quite important on some of the things that I value in terms of games. So I want to present one quite maybe controversial, controversial point. We'll, we'll see what uh, people think. Uh, so what I think is the grind is dead. So... With MMOs, it's something that's always bothered me is when you have to run around and grind in MMOs. So specifically, uh, for, from my perspective, the grind is where you have to go around repeatedly killing, killing some AI that's running around, look for the guys with question marks above their heads, and do the quests that they're asking you to do. And you do this again and again and again so that you can then go out and raid with your friends. Now, there's a few games that don't do this, uh, that are MMOs, and, and that, are, you know, that are really awesome and stuff like that. So I really want to, I guess this is the, the fundamental approach that I want to take with MMOs, is where we don't have to push into the grind. Uh, some of the reasons that designers have traditionally postulated that they use the grind is um, basically because designers are told to provide solvable problems. So when you're going out and you're, you're, you're designing your game or, or you, you, get, you, give, you get one of your designers to design a mechanic, the idea is that the player should be able to get from this point in the level to the end of the level. It should be completable. But actually, when I think back to a lot of the games I played on the Amiga, uh, like Swiv and stuff, I don't know whether they were ever completable. And I, I don't think that, I think I read somewhere the guy who, who made Faster Than Light said that he didn't actually think anyone would ever complete it or something. Uh, so I do like the fact that there are a lot of designers out there who, who aren't about, let's make something that players can solve, let's make a mechanic that's cool or awesome. Uh, and I definitely find when I've talked a lot with more traditional publishers, they tend to really get hung up on this. They're like, wow, we need the player to be able to do this. But actually, when I play games like Project Zomboid or Space Engineers or that with my friends, I find what we like doing is looking for a problem and then trying to solve it. We don't really care whether it's actually possible. We just sort of like the trying. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, that's definitely, that, that's from my perspective, is why designers tend to use the grind. The problems with it is, it's really, really expensive. So Elder Scrolls Online, uh, I, I would argue it makes extensive use of the grind. And what they have to do is they have to employ an army of designers to make all those quests and then to make sure that they all work and that they all function together. So it's hugely expensive. It means you make games that cost hundreds of millions of dollars, games like Destiny, things like that. So... Yeah, that's, that's, I guess, one of the big problems with it. It's very expensive, and an expensive game means you can't take much risk because you've got to go to as broad an audience as possible. Uh, and, um, yeah, so it basically, what I think it does is it actually limits the freedom that the players have to go out and engage in their own experiences, particularly with their friends. So what I'd like to introduce is what I'm calling Hall's Law, which is basically that all things being equal a random interaction between human players will always be more compelling than one that is scripted. So I guess that's what I consider the basis of the games that I want to make, is that I want to look at ways to make the, the players kind of do the grind amongst themselves. 
And I guess if you don't believe me there, I'd say, well, how do we explain reality TV? You know, uh, here comes Honey Boo Boo, stuff like that. You know, Twitter, Facebook, I think, I think and you know, Reddit, I think people more than ever before, they want to they wanna engage, and they want to engage with other people. It's like you don't want to ring up the phone and be, and be talking to some bot on the end of the phone. Well, it's the same thing with me with games. I don't want to be uh, running around looking for computers with question marks. So I kind of came to the conclusion that I don't really like games, uh, which is a bit of a problem. I, I like exploring solutions and problems, particularly with my friends. So that's running up space engineers and seeing can we build a big like dry dock or automated dry dock or going into Project Zomboid and saying can we, uh, you know, can we, how long can we survive? And it's the same thing with DayZ, how, how, long, how long can we survive? These aren't problems that a designer has sat down and said, well, you know what, we've calculated this and they'll survive for 15 hours and they'll get, you know, 7.2 hours of new content, but they'll be, you know, redoing their previous time. Uh, whereas previous games I'd worked on, that was very much the design approach, a real quantitative approach to the design. I didn't like that. So I call this context gaming. And that is basically where the game has a sense of purpose, where you actually feel like you own your experience. And it's been really hard for me to think how to describe it. Another game I get it in is when I play EU4 multiplayer. I really feel, or CK2, particularly CK2, because you get to build your empire and eugenics and all that, good, that, that stuff, almost said good stuff. Um, and, uh, and, and it really... I found with, with games like that, I really do get a sense of purpose. And I really do feel like I'm actually creating my empire. And I guess what I'm looking at trying to do is how can I actually deliver that in a MMO perspective? So, yeah, I guess to summarize it up, it's, it's building something that matters. It's that why you build the nuclear reactor and tech it. My friends would be like, let's, let's play Ticket, let's build a nuclear reactor. But I, in the back of my mind, I'd, I'd always be going, why are we doing this? And they're like, because, because we can get lots of energy. And I, I, I'm saying, well, what, what are we going to do with the energy? And, and, I, and that's where the context comes from. And that's what I think is really important. And we've struggled to do this with DayZ. We've, we've tried to look for those opportunities to actually build context from what you're doing. And yeah, like I said at the bottom there, the why, to why build that giant space station and space engineers? So uh, I guess as an example, for me, the problem with Skyrim was that it was really good. I logged into Skyrim and the environment was unreal. The river flowing, the snow, the transitions between the areas, but it, it just didn't matter to me. I, I stood in the river and I was like, well, my dude's not wet. And then I'd put on all my plate mail armor and I'd run up the hill and I'd be like, why isn't my guy cold? And it was like I was just floating around. And then I just amassed more and more and more gear. And no matter what happened, I felt like I couldn't really lose. Yeah, I could lose a bit of progress and I'd have to reload. But no matter what happened, my guy was just getting better and better. And for me, that just entirely lacked, uh, that lacked context. So the simple way to add context is to add multiplayer. And this is what I was really gunning for with Project Multiplayer, uh, sorry, Project Zomboid. And we got it, we got multiplayer. And it really does, for me, add a huge amount of context to Project Zomboid. And when you go in and you play it single player, at least for me, I find after a while I start asking those why questions. But in multiplayer, you just don't tend to. And if I had to pick why DayZ was super successful, a lot of people say, oh, because it's a survival game because it's got permadeath, because it's got zombies. Well, <laughs> let's face it, our zombies, uh, you can't really say that the zombies are the strength of the game when they walk through walls and, and they attack you through walls and stuff like that. So I think that one's a pretty easy one to strike off. In my opinion, the real strength of DayZ and the reason it was successful is because I, is I took griefers and I took the people, let's call them care bears, and I put them together. And the Care Bears needed the Griefers because they give that sense of fear to the situation. And the Griefers need the Care Bears because they need someone to kill. And I think the, the reality is that actually if you talk to most players, they'll, you know, I was signing things outside and someone would be like, oh, you were totally survivors unless someone pisses us off. 
So I think the reality is, is that most people are kind of a bit of both. But when you take those two disparate groups and you put them together in a game, you actually give the whole thing context. It becomes this big cycle. So from my perspective, this means that I want to try and build a, a universe in a game. And I really hated putting this in the presentation because it sounds so cliche. It's like our game is this open world universe and, and all this kind of thing. But uh, I guess it's a design philosophy that sort of says build it and they will come. So you build the structure, you build the consistency of the whole, the whole world, and then you just give it to the players. And when I've talked to a lot of more traditional designers and, and been interviewing them, them and that, that's very scary because that's not how you design a game. What if they, what if they can't survive? What if uh, the whole economy goes under? What if, what if it's really boring? What if the players don't know what to do when they spawn in? So if you're really wanting to do something of a very big scale, really it's a massive leap of faith. But from what I've seen, uh, I think gamers are just hanging out for these kind of games and actually being given the game, not just being given an experience. So one of the big problems that is faced with that is this idea of the player economy. I've talked a lot with CCP, Valve, companies like that about what it would actually take to build a real player economy in a world that was owned by the players. And one of the big problems I see is that people think open world means you should just do whatever you want. So you can build this, you can build that, like, say like Minecraft. But for me, Minecraft lacks a bit of context because I kind of need those restrictions of the real world. It's like in the Matrix film, remember the computers, they were like, they, they made a perfect world that they plugged everyone into and everyone was like, this is totally not real. It's the same kind of thing for me. If I play a game and I feel like I can do anything, I'm like, ah, this isn't like real life. Real life sucks. So... So you kind of need your game to suck a little bit as well. Um, and uh, that's not why we put the zombies the way they are in DayZ as well. Um, so, yeah, the, the, big, the big challenge with the economy is how do you actually control it? Uh, and I don't really have an answer to that yet, but uh, hopefully soon I will. Uh, I guess one big thing for me is to try and make sustainable games. So... Uh, that's one where the gaming experience actually lasts a very long time. The example that I can think of straight to my mind is OpenTDD. Has anyone, how many people have actually played Open Transport Tycoon Deluxe? All these good people here. Yeah, everyone else should check it out. It's a free game based on Chris Sawyer's uh, Transport Tycoon Deluxe, which was released, I think, in like the late 90s, maybe something like that. And uh, the game got re engineered. Uh, by a team of volunteers and released as OpenTDD. So it's a free game, and you build, like, trains. You actually get to build your own train network. And uh, it's really awesome. I don't know, I can't, I can't say that without getting really excited about it. And, uh, you know, you build your junctions, and your junctions are, like, awesome. So you should totally check it out. But that's, that's the kind of game I want to make, where people are still playing it after a long period of time. And this brings up a couple of uh, problems. And uh, I wonder if hopefully people will have some good questions about it because it's something I've been doing a lot of research and a lot of soul searching and thinking on is how do you finance games? Uh, I'm not comfortable with Kickstarter. I don't know why. I just, I just don't like it. I think there's, for me personally, I, I'm not knocking it for anyone else. I just think there's something fundamentally wrong with it for me. Where if I'm selling you something, I think you should actually get something, not just the promise of it. It's why I don't like loans, stuff like that. It's the same with Kickstarter for me. It's just, it's just not quite there. I've got some big problems with early access. We've not really been out, able to find a way with Daisy to get around this one, but I think there is just a fundamental group of people who don't understand uh, what it means. And I don't think that's their fault. I think the challenge is, as a developer, and you know, working with people like Valve to find out how we can do that. And I don't know what the answer is. Uh, I saw people joking on Reddit about IQ tests and stuff, but I don't think, I don't think that's what it's, what it's about. I think that everyone can have sort of a unique experience of when they're playing something like DayZ. And so, yeah, I'm not really comfortable with where early access is at. And I'm also not com comfortable with the traditional publishing model. So what I want to try and do is take the best from all of them and put them together, which sounds really easy when you say it like that, but it's probably not. The other thing that I'm not happy with at all is payment methods. 
So Daisy's now sold like 2.6 million copies of the standalone. Plus, well, no, that's how many people have played it. There's usually about 10% of people who've bought it but haven't played it. Um, and uh, so that's a, lot of, that's a lot of copies sold, and it's a lot of money. But what if Daisy didn't sell that many copies? We wouldn't be getting any of the stuff that we are now. And also, there's a sunk cost to, to us as Bohemia with uh, selling a copy of DayZ. We run quite a large number of uh, servers. We run the central server, which costs uh, a very large amount of money each year. So there's a real sunk cost. And so this one-time payment thing of DayZ, I don't actually think that's a really good way to fund a multiplayer game. Uh, Guild Wars has kind of managed to pull it off, but... I just think I think it's I think it's fairly dangerous. I also really don't like free to play. People say to me, "Well, you know, you could sell cosmetic items, but there's no cosmetic items in Daisy." I'd love to say, "Let's make Daisy free to play," because it's just like a license to print money. But um, it just offends the my sense of of logic. There's no cosmetic items in Daisy. There's there's none. And if if there if we are channeling some items that just don't matter, like party hats or something, then we're doing it wrong. And if we make it so you pay for it, we're kind of totally breaking that sense of player economy. And uh, yeah, and I also don't like the subscription model. The, the subscription model does not fit well with me, and I think a lot of people just kind of abandon it. You get a lot of specialist people, like EVE players. They're totally specialist people. Um, and, uh, and they're okay with it. But I think with a game like that, particularly that it, it came along at a time when subscription was okay, uh, I, I really think if we made Daisy say, a subscription game, I think it would probably kill it. So what I'm really looking at doing is trying to find some kind of combination or some new way of providing the game that doesn't break the design. So that's uh, kind of enough of me talking. Uh, really, I'm hopeful that people have some nice, hard tough questions for me, um, and yeah, um, feel free to, yeah, pretty much ask anything. Yeah, if you do have a oh, hello. Uh, if you do have a question, um, make your way to that lovely X in the uh, middle of the aisle there, and form a nice orderly queue, and we'll get a microphone in your face, uh, so you can direct it in Dean's way. Um, so yeah, any questions at all? We've got some people making their way through the aisles. Either that or he's running for the exit very quickly. That too, yeah. If he is, we should probably follow him, really. Hello there. Hello. Firstly, Daisy is amazing. I spent like 50 hours on it, and it's ongoing. Probably less than people with 200 or 1,000 hours. Anyway, one question. When a vehicle's being added? Nice. I'm kind of glad that came up. It was either, it takes me it was like a 20 minutes from DMR. spawn to get to the airfields, or 40 on a bad day. Yeah, so one of the, the big things, it kind of represents... What we tried to do with Daisy, which was we really wanted to, we didn't just want to do the mod. Like the mod was done, I think a lot of people got really frustrated with that, and this kind of comes back to my point about early access. It can be very difficult to communicate, particularly when things really explode. So a lot of people wanted us to just use the vehicles from the mod, but if we did that, we'd basically just be releasing you what we'd already done and taking money for it. And it wasn't that, I mean, that sounds kind of cool because, again, that's pretty cheap. But this was a real opportunity to do, so, do something different. So the vehicles we've been actually developing have full, proper physics. So uh, Fido, our, um, our tech lead, uh, he'd been working previously on his own engine at Black Element with his team, and they're the team who were behind Carrier Command. It's actually an incredibly slick engine. If you want to see how it looks in practice, you should try out Take On Mars which has awesome vehicles in it, and now it's got multiplayer. And that kind of gives you an idea of the level of physics. I think even in Take on Mars, when you put the little containers in the back of the vehicle, I think it even has actual physics on it. So that kind of gives you an example. So that's being worked on now. Um, I think it's covered in the dev blog that we just produced. So yeah, that's, that's basically the delay. But what we'll do is we'll see them very soon come out and experimental, but I wouldn't expect them to come straight to stable too soon. I'd say they'll come into experimental, we'll find out they break everything. We'll go try to fix them and then come back. Thank you. Thanks. I'm just going to quickly jump to Twitch who have some questions as well. The internet has questions for you. Whoa, the so internet. address the internet, which is all around us. Um, what Seven asks, uh, are you somehow going to still influence DayZ's production after you leave Bohemia? That's another good question. So 
uh, I guess me and Bohemia kind of have a marriage over at AZ, so I'll definitely always been involved. I've tried to take a little bit of a back seat in terms of the PR stuff, um, mainly because I think a lot of people thought that it was just me uh, making DayZ, and what I really wanted them to do is show how awesome a lot of the team members are. People know Brian, um, people know Eugene now, our build manager, they know Chris, our art lead, they know Senshi, our glorious Russian map designer, uh, and uh, they, they know all, all the people on the team. So that was really the aim with, uh, with that. And so yeah, I'll definitely be involved for the life of the project. But my role is moving more from being the project lead more to being like the creator. So just helping to tweak the vision rather than the day-to-day -day management of the project. And, uh, and I think actually, you know, regardless of, even if I wanted to stay in the Czech Republic long term, I don't necessarily think I'm the best person to take the whole production and move it forward. I was more focused on the vision. So hopefully that's answered your question. Yeah, that's very, very good. And back to the room, please. Hey there, um, my name is Steve. Um, hello. Uh, and I'm an avid animator, I'm 16 years old, and I'm wondering what is the, currently the best way to get into the industry as an animator. Yeah, interesting. Uh, I guess my first caveat is I'm not an animator. However, I have uh, played one in movies. No, uh, I, I've, I've dabbled with a little bit of animation myself. It's not something I'm very good at. I tried to make, I was working on uh, a space mod for Arma where I replaced all the physics for armor, and um, a couple of my friends have actually played it. And I tried to do walk cycles for a character on the moon, so I can, I, I, I appreciate how difficult your job is. I guess the other caveat I'd add is that uh, my opinion of how you get in the industry is probably very much tainted by how I did. I had worked in the industry previously before I joined the army as a producer, and uh, but I didn't like it, so I quit. But Definitely what my opinion is, is that it's really good to have something finished that you can show. So as an example, uh, I, I pick modding. So I think modding's a really good way because sometimes taking on a whole project with your friends, say, is just too much. But when we're looking for animators, when we're looking for anyone in the video game industry, what I want to see is I don't really care that much about their CV. I don't care that much necessarily about what qualifications they have, although I would say that HR agencies do, and nine times out of 10 before I see anyone's stuff, um, they've been pre-screened by a recruiting company. So uh, yeah, the, the portfolio is critical, like really, really important. And it doesn't, that doesn't mean it needs to be really flash or fancy, it's just like literally a couple of videos showing your work um, and demonstrating a willingness to work as a team, particularly as an animator. And Probably one of the big attributes I look for in an animator is the ability to be told to redo the same thing again and again and again. So an example I'd use is uh, Victor, our lead animator. Um, I, he had literally just finished making all the animations for drinking with the left hand, and then we decided that all actions were going to be done with the right hand. So literally the day he finished that, we went back to him and said, oh, by the way, could you just, you know, surely it's easy, you just, like, reverse the sides, and it's just like this. Yeah. So, um, has that kind of answered your question? Like, I would, I would encourage looking at modding, or even if you want to get a little bit, uh, I guess, uh, out of the, uh, you know, into the more difficult zone, is trying to put something together with some friends with, like, Unity or Unreal or stuff like that. Um, is that, I mean, does that sound similar to what you're thinking? Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. Cool. Um, also, what's your accent? Uh, New Zealand. Ah, okay. Yeah, at least you didn't call me Australian. You know, <laughs> bad things and stuff. Um, the internet has just died uh, forever, so let's keep it in the room for now, thanks. Hi, um, I've got a question about, pretty boring, but financing. Mm -hmm. um, talk about getting rid of grinding and starting up new player economies, which are fascinating and actually is something that I'm involved with at the moment, mm -hmm. and I mean, have been raising finance for the last year and it's hell yeah um but the things that you're talking about they're it's not like they're sort of lean models that are scalable they like there is that huge sunk mm -hmm. cost at the start if you want to do something at scale 
Um, and you sort of touched on new ways of, and I, funny enough, I share your opinion on Kickstarter. It's a, sort of an intangible uncomfortability. It's like yeah. difficult to put your finger on. But I mean, it's like, how are you approaching financing pro projects at the moment? Is it, are you going down sort of, are you looking for venture backing or are you looking at the bigger uh, studios? Well, I or? did and I kind of still am, but very reluctantly. Mm. Again, because I just, Part of the problem is I want to take big risks. I decided after Day Z that I could just not work in the games industry again, or if I was going to, I would do the thing that I really, really, really wanted to do. It's why I don't, want to, I don't like working on sequels. I want to work on something really risky and difficult. The problem is, uh, if you run up a $100 million project, or even a $20 million, or even a $10 million project, you can't really take a lot of risk. Mm. Uh, so you bring up a good point. One of the, the problems is, is that making video games is really, really expensive. And making multiplayer games is ridiculously exp expensive. Uh, I think from my, the only sort of little tools that I can, can use to try and get around that is really good prototyping. I'm really into developing a prototype and developing a cheap prototype, essentially one that you just throw away. Uh, I, I've used like the Beyond engine, little like simple yeah. top-down 2D engine, stuff like that to develop rapid prototypes or, or modding or even Unity or something like that. And that can help you get venture funding. There's a lot of venture funding out there for this at the moment. And there's a lot of traditional publisher funding out there. But the problem is they want to go with the proven stuff. Yeah. Uh, and so I'll have people uh, who've said, yeah, yeah, we'll give you this money to do this. But I realize that when I take their money, they're going to ask a lot of questions. And they're going to be like, after about two weeks, they're going to be like, you, you want to do what? And so from my perspective, I've just been bankrolling it myself. And you know, I'm reluctantly considering stuff. I think for someone coming in from outside uh, who, who's maybe struggling with that, the hard part can be finding the right venture funder. Uh, I also think that Maybe when we get crowdsourced equity funding, I know New Zealand's been experimenting with that, where people can actually you know, buy a tiny bit of equity in your studio. That might be another option as well. Yep. Cheers. Good luck. Yeah. Thank you very much. Another one from the room, please. Thanks. Hello. I was just wondering in regards to the, uh, the whole hypothetical problem you've posed, um, or this, this new model, uh, where would modding fit into it or you know community mm. involvement in interaction where would that fit in with this hypothetical new model that you, you're thinking about yeah i'm actually really glad that you asked that because i just realized i forgot a whole slide uh that talked about that so this is this kind of brings up there was a lot of people who were really peed off with me with the standalone because we didn't start off with modding and in a way it seems like seems a bit like a slap in the face because you know, Daisy came from modding, and then we don't put modding in at the start. I guess my desire is I really like these environments that have a lot of structure. I think to really provide a fully compelling experience, the kind that I like to play, it needs to have structure and risk, and that's where the whole survival element comes from. So what I'm wanting to do is actually put the content creation in the game. Uh, if you have a very boxed, uh, like if you have a, uh, like limited experience, like say Space Engineers, I think is a brilliant example of really seamless integration of mods. I don't know if anyone has tried it, but it's got really great mods. Basically, you just join the server and it, uh, through Steam Workshop, it downloads all the mods. It's really easy. Um, but if you really, if you really want to make a really complicated experience, it's really hard to do that. Mm. So, yeah, I guess the long-winded answer to your question is that. I want to try and find a way of actually having it so that the players create the content inside the structure of the universe themselves. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Hi, I'm Harry. I have two questions, if that's all right. Sure. Is that cool? All right. Uh, firstly, I was, you were mentioning that grind is dead and that's not what people want. Um, what are your thoughts on the popularity of things like incremental games, where it's just pretty much 100% grind? Do you feel like that people sort of seek out grind still? And what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, I think, um, I think when I put that up, I think uh, deep down I accept that it's not necessarily true, but that's certainly how I'd like to see the world. So uh, I don't really, like I say, maybe I don't really like games. And so from my perspective, <laughs> I, you know, that's why I call it context gaming. So I, I think you're right. And uh, some of the literature I've read talks about people finding relaxation 
and the grind. I guess my big problem is that when the grind is done with AI, AI is so rudimentary um, compared to a human. And that's why you know, I, am, I implement my Hull's Law, where I think that you could still do repetitive action, but if it's with another player, there's a level of unpredictability there that's just so fascinating. And I, I think that, that there's a lot of reluctance, maybe not so much from designers, but definitely from publishers and developers, to actually opening the floodgates and saying, you know what, we don't care if this problem's not solvable, we're just gonna give the world to the players and let them run. Thank you, and my second question is, from a developer point of view, can you explain how your sort of day-to-day -day sort of life as a developer changed from going from like a small team to basically running a studio? Yeah, wow. Um, and I think everyone who's involved in like getting promoted or anything in the video game industry will tell you that there's a dramatic change in the amount of time that you have to do anything, and uh, you end up running from sort of crisis to crisis. Uh, I guess it was compounded as well as, as I have very specific ways that I want to do things and I might want to do them instantly, whereas then you've got to look at someone like Bohemia who has got to you know, deal with the current and, and deal with the, the now and, and actually go through a proper production model. And that was the idea behind me stepping back from the lead production role into more of helping maintain the creative vision because I just ended up spending all my time on production-related tasks, and I was certainly not the best person, uh, or at least I don't think so, and I'm sure there's plenty of people on the internet who would agree, um, the best person to be doing that. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, because I think it's harder to be a control freak when there's a much bigger... That's right, project. exactly. Right. Yeah, you need someone who's prepared to beat you and say, don't do that, Dean. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Cool. Thanks a lot. Hi, Arya. I'm just wondering, regarding context, you say, you know, adding multiplayer, I just want to see where you see games such as, like, Dwarf Fortress, or to an extent, like single, single player, uh, Project Zomboid fit in, and like the Daisy start off as a single player, and then it evolve into multiplayer, or what exactly happened there? Yeah, that's a really fascinating perspective. I haven't really sort of, yeah. So I think, um, I think with that, and I I played uh, No Moria recently on Steam. Yeah. I think this is my belief with it, and I have to say I'm not 100% sure, but I think there is such a depth of simulation in it that it spills over into context gaming. And another example I'd use that's right on the precipice of that is Prison Architect. Mm -hmm. There's so much like simulation going on that it almost you know, achieves this critical mass of context. And then it's like, wow. And I think that Dwarf Fortress is like the gold standard of levels of crazy level of complexity. And I think it's like a snowball effect, like a snowball run rolling down the hill. You try something out and you're like, you, you could do that? And then you learn something else about it, and you're like, what? And then it just leads you on this big path. We tried to do that with DayZ, but it's very hard because, like, when we want to do a new feature and, uh, like, you know, the character can eject themselves or something, there can be a three month period of work. Like, you've got to motion capture the animations, you've got to create all the art assets for both first person and all that kind of stuff. There's a, it's a huge lead time. Whereas you look at something like Project Zomboid or Prison Architect, because the graphics are relatively straightforward, it means they can iterate much faster, sometimes in a day, uh, to add new features. And I guess Daisy, Daisy was always multiplayer. I'd uh, been working in my own gaming group for a long time to link Armour to a database. It was the first C++ app I'd ever written uh, to do that using an... Uh, um, uh, like a, I can't remember what it's called now, but yeah, basically linking the linking the two. So it always started out as multiplayer. Uh, I don't know whether I'm very good at single player, although I want to try and make a single player game. I've been try working on one for like five years, but yeah. Cool. All right, cheers. Thanks. Um, just before we move on to the last few questions from the room, the internet, the remnants of the internet have got another question for you. Uh, it's Cyberwhite asks, what's your opinion on how Star Citizen delivers its early access? How what, sorry? How Star Citizen delivers its early access. Mm. Well, very well. Um, <laughs> very, <laughs> very well. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I'm super jealous of Star Citizen for a couple of reasons. You know, I mean, Chris Roberts. Yeah. Like, Chris Roberts. So, um, but not only that, but they have this amazing team of people. Like, they really do. I think the guy who did the open source pathfinding solution that we uh, now use for DayZ, I think he actually works on their team. Uh, I think that... Uh, they've, yeah, they've just done superbly. Um, and I guess the only danger I'd feel if I was in that situation is managing the scope. Um, 
But I guess from my perspective, there's no doubt that that project's going to be successful simply because of the sheer weight of awesome people that have been assembled on it. But if it was me, I'd be pretty terrified about trying to manage the scope. Um, because while I think it's up to, is it $50 million or pounds? I think that's dollars, but it's, it's, dollars. A, it's a significant amount. It's a, it's a lot of money, but then you look, I think uh, Elder Scrolls Online cost $100 million. So you can really easily um, spend, that, spend that money on parties or something, I don't know. Um, and uh, yeah, so while it sounds like a lot, I think you do still have to manage the scope. And I guess it's too, it's too soon to say how successful was Star Citizen. Certainly, their early access launch was very successful, and I think that just shows the amount of, I guess, respect and admiration people have for Chris Roberts and his concept, and how much people wanted that kind of gameplay. Cool. Thank you very much. And back to your question. Hi, Dean. I have two questions, if that's okay. Sure. Um, with the talking about modding, do you and the development team sort of take any inspiration from some of the mods? from the DayZ mod, such as like an epoch, where you can build bases and trade with gold and that kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. So, huge amount of inspiration. I think at uh, PAX, we had a similar question, talking about the lockable containers and things like that. So, there's a tremendous amount of inspiration from the team. Peter, our lead designer, uh, he's always looking around and looking at what people are doing. So, absolutely. And uh, to be honest, even more than vehicles, I'm excited for when we get modding implemented with DayZ. I think that if it wasn't for things like Play With Six and DayZ Commander, the DayZ mod just never would have taken off. So we had to rely on the community a tremendous amount, not only for new ideas, but also to even distribute the mod. And uh, so I think there's a bit of work we can do with Steam Workshop integration. I think when we do that, that will inspire us with the development as well with the mods that the players make. I mean, look at Kerbal Space Program. Some of the mods have actually become part of the game. Some of the people making the mods have been hired. It's uh, similar with us. We've ended up hiring a lot of the modders. Armour has an incredible history of hiring modders. I'm a modder that came in from the community with Armour as well. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's good heritage there, and I think that the sooner we can get into providing mods for Daisy, the better. And uh, secondly... Uh, this is kind of like off to completely off topic, but um, what was it like standing on top of the world? True. It was pretty awesome, uh, I guess. It was also very cold. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, that was like a dream for a long period of time that I'd wanted to do. So it was kind of like talking to your 16-year-old self. Uh, I think, it, it, you know, when I was 16, I had all these crazy dreams and ambitions. And then as I got a bit older... You know, it costs a lot of money to climb Everest, so I, I just had kind of forgotten it. And when I sort of thought about things I wanted to do, that was the first thing that popped into my head. So it was like going, being able to go back to your 16-year-old self and saying, absolutely have those kind of dreams, because, you know, they do, they do happen. Thank you. Cool, thanks. We've got time for one last question. Thanks. Hi, how's it going? First, congratulations on climbing Everest. Cheers. <laughs> um, I found it quite fascinating what you were saying about the grind being dead but I can't help but think that the problem with relying quite a lot on player interactions is that if the player base was to dwindle, then the whole game would sort of fall apart. So I suppose my question is, have you completely, um, like, completely eradicated the idea of free-to-play altogether? Because, I mean, yes, as you said, it gets used quite a lot for um, paying for... Um, um, uh, I can't even think of the word like now. Like pay-to-win. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to say it can also it, it can also be used to pay for the convenience. Is yes. What gets used yep. in a lot of um, a lot of quite popular free to play games. So I mean, off the top of my head for Daisy, I mean that could be used for something such as um, being able to pay to get your life back, perhaps. Um, yeah. Or, or respawn uh, timers. Yeah. And stuff exactly. Like that. Um, I mean, have you considered any other sort of free to play options just to keep the play? I, I think that there is options in there, but I, I think that that's why I'm trying to look for a max, look for opportunities. Mm. To be honest, with the next game that I release it will involve going to the community and saying, we want to make a sustainable model, we are going to try this, and then we will ask and find out. But I think if I'm using any of those type of elements, they shouldn't be core elements of the revenue from the game, because I would just want to be able to yank them at a moment's notice. If we know it's not working, just get rid of it. Um, I also think your point about the player interactions and not being enough players is actually really excellent, because... 
that's one of the key, I guess, design philosophies of multiplayer I have, which is make it fun if there's just one person. Mm. And I think if you do, that was my aim with DayZ. I wanted it to be fun if it was just me and maybe a couple of my friends. And so I've kind of taken that and I apply that to all the design work I do now is make it fun if it's just you. Because then you can just be pottering away. A good example of that is Space Engineers for me or Project Zomboid and Multiplay. It's still fun even if it's just you knocking around on it. And so I, I think that's the answer there. And if you're making an open world game, it's a bit easier to do that than if you're doing something like Battlefield or, or Star Citizen or, or Elite Dangerous where it's very focused on combat uh, because you need the other players to provide the combat. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for your questions. Uh, we're going to have to move on because they're going to tear this place down. Uh, thank you so much for coming to the last ever EGX 2014 session. Um, obviously, we're going to be back next year for EGX Res in London and EGX at an undisclosed location same time next year. Um, Dean is also going to be hanging around for the 8-Bit podcast at 6 p.m., um, which is down at the front of the show floor. So if you haven't had enough of him yet, I'm sure you can get a bit more uh, in about 15 minutes or so. But yeah, please, a big round of applause for Dean Hall. Thank you.